have held me in your arms in my head I've been witness to your charms a thousand times You have sung me a love song in my head So you are very welcome to the third episode of The Attic Sessions and today we are going to be talking about what is called Emerald Noir in some uh, places. It is the incredible energy that is the Irish crime and thriller writing movement. And we're going to be doing it in the company of two terrific um, writers of the genre, Louise Phillips and Paul Perry, who is one half of the writing duo Karen Perry. Louise, Paul, you're very welcome to the attic. Great to great have you to both here. here. Thank you. Um, and I suppose it would be great to get a sense of, first of all, how you both got involved, and then maybe we'll 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 talk about the larger movement. But but you know, to start, Louise, how how did you discover crime writing? Well, initially, I thought uh, I came into crime writing purely by accident. I mean, I I, I started writing short stories and. They tended to be quite dark stories um, and usually dealt with people on the edge of society. So perhaps it was a kind of natural kind of transition into crime novel writing. But when I had my first draft of the first novel done, I didn't really see it as a crime novel uh, until somebody said to me, that's a crime novel. Um, and I think the accident of it was probably good for me because I didn't set out to write a particular crime novel within a particular genre, etc. Mm -hmm. um, but over the last few years, um, since the first novel came out, I've kind of looked back at the, the type of things that influenced me um, in my reading, like at an early stage. And, you know, I look back and I realise that, like I say, when I was a very young person, way younger than I am now, um, the likes of sort of um, Wuthering Heights and those sort of mm. dark stories. Mm. Were, and I remember having a fixation with Emily Dickinson's poetry and all that type of thing. And then later on, um, I suppose, again, more by accident than design, p books like, say, Animal Farm by George Orwell or um, Lord of the Flies, that kind of looked at humanity within society and, and, and those sort of things. And psychological thrillers. Yeah, sort of yeah. Idea. So um, I, I suppose I did most things consciously by accident or subconsciously by accident. But, but when I, because I've reflected over the last couple of years, because people often ask me that question, I realised that there was probably a certain path I was going along, mm -hmm. um, and and so here I am. Very good. And and Paul, I mean, it's it your route is is interesting too because you're very well known as well as 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 a poet. Um, so how does a poet find their way into crime writing, or thriller writing, or would you call it crime writing? Um, I suppose it's a subgenre of crime writing. Um, myself and Karen Gillies, I so we write uh, psychological thrillers. And as Louise said, I found my way into um, writing thrillers by accident, um, not by design, nothing premeditated about the, uh, the partnership that I have with Karen. Um, yes, yeah, so I was writing poetry and short stories since I was a student, um, publishing more poetry than fiction. And then um, I had met Karen many years ago at a literary festival in Listow, actually, Listow Writers Week. And we became friends. And then we met up one evening. We were talking about writing. And I suppose as a, as a joke, even I said, what about writing a book together? And um, she said, that's a great idea. I'm working on this, um, I'm working on this very difficult, dark, historical novel it could give me a good break from that. And um, following up on that, um, I was in town in November 2010 and a demonstration was going on and the snow was falling and there was a helicopter in the air. And, and there was a journalist speaking on a stage in front of the GPO and I thought, wow, this is a great opening scene. And I went home and wrote that first chapter. I sent it to Karen not knowing what she would do with it, even mm. if she would read it. But what came back was chapter two of our first novel, The Boy That Never Was. And um, what is it now, five and a half years later, we're working on our fourth novel. Mm -hmm. So, and again, had you been reading 
prior to that? Had you been reading that sort of genre? Was yeah, I mean, I, I think when myself and Karen sat down to decide to write a book together, we started with characters. We started with a married couple who were on a journey. We didn't know whether it was going to be uh, a literary thriller or crime. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what emerged was, um, was uh, kind of suspenseful. It was, there was a crime committed. Um, but again, that emerged out of the storytelling. And I mean, I suppose I'm not really too hung up on the categories or definitions. Mm -hmm. I mean, th the fact that I wrote poetry and short stories, and I, I kind of see it and enjoy it, that kind of fluidity of definition. Mm. That I, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to be pigeonholed. And, mm -hmm. um, and I don't think um, I let myself be. And in that sense, different writers have, have um, like Dennis Johnson, the American writer who writes poetry, he writes short stories, he writes novels mm -hmm. in in different kinds of novels. Sophie they Hannah. Is Sophie Hannah. Example of a poetry yeah, name. I mean, yeah, they serve as examples. Yeah. So, um, so that you're not, as I say, pigeonholed as one thing or another. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, what um, is the challenge for both of you um, when you're at the beginning? You have a, an idea for a story, how, how much do you need to work out how the story is going to develop at the very beginning or how does it work? I think kind of going back to Paul's point about not restricting yourself within the genre, I think when it comes to storytelling, it is simply about characters and story um, and what happens when all these uh, factors come together. I recognise that most of my writing is going to be quite dark. I'm, I'm more interested in individuals that are, mm. I, I don't think I'll ever write a happy novel, which is probably terrible for my children. But um, so I, I do know that. But so usually it starts with an idea. And, and also f for me, and, I, and I'd say for a lot of writers, it's usually important to come up with something different. Like I do have um, a criminal psychologist in the first four books. Mm. But to a degree, a lot of each of the stories would, within the four novels are about other people in the stories. She's kind of like a, a link along the, uh, along the way. Um, so I like to be excited by, by the story. So say, for example, with Red Ribbons, which was the first one, um, I kind of concentrated on my own fear, which was, um, I suppose, the bad man in society because I was had two young girls and they were a little bit older and so that was kind of the I suppose the, the theme and with the doll's house I got really interested in memory and how much you can trust memory and hypnosis and again that was it and but each of them kind of tend to have some kind of a psychological disorder as well just to add spice to it um, and certainly with the last one with the game changer it was the influence of groups and how one person can manipulate another person so I get the kind of general idea of where I'm, I'm going and then it's a question of seeing who's going to occupy that world. I, I don't plot, mm -hmm. um, you know that already from previous conversations, um, which means an, a lot of rewriting. Um, and the only time I ever use a roadmap is really in the final chapters. And even that, I tend to deviate from it. But um, what I have learned over the four novels is as much as anyone can to trust the process mm -hmm. that the first drafts are, are never what you want them to be mm -hmm. they're, they're only really you telling the story to yourself mm -hmm. and then the story changes if that answers the question uh, but to follow on just a little it, do you think that by exploring so much darkness mm. is is and you use the kind of the bogeyman uh, analogy a little earlier as well is there something about making yourself feel safer if you explore it on page? No, like, again, I, sh I probably used the word accident a number of times in this interview, but the, the first working draft for Red Ribbons was actually um, a character um, assignment that I put myself because I was at a, a workshop and the facilitator there said that on your first novel you shouldn't really switch genres so if you're a woman your protagonist should be from a female point of view and if you're a guy it should be a male point of view and I don't really like people telling me what to do mm -hmm. so I thought okay well I'm going to start writing from a male point of view and um, I thought well if, if I'm going to write from a male point of view what kind of male point of view 
do I want to write from? Mm -hmm. And so the so that's where that kind of started. And the title for that was Getting Inside a Bad Man's Head. Mm. Um, so I think I think there's an element of the fact that it's obviously a, like I do like my baddies, but um, it's not that you kind of are drawn to dark and terrible people, but I'm also I'm kind of drawn to why people become the way they are. Mm. I think that's possibly why I write psychological fiction. And l most of my characters, and, and I think a lot of writers will strive for this, is that there's no necessarily good guys or bad guys. There are some people's heads who are more messed up than others. It's as simply as that, simple as that. Um, but I, uh, but I also feel I, as a child, I understood fear greatly. Like, like you know, watching the likes of Alfred Hitchcock or things like that. Overactive imagination, do you know, mm -hmm. and I mm -hmm. still have that. So I think I, I maybe it is a safety mm. net, mm. Um, but for whatever it is, it's what I'm drawn to mm. write. But readers and writers, like you know, it, it's from the gothic fiction onwards there's been this huge interest in being terrified by what we 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 you should look read. at fairy tales children's Grim, stories absolutely. children's stories are, are full of scary yeah. characters so yeah there is that so so paul from the writer's point of view exploring those depths in the way that you've been with with uh, karen is there have you sort of analyzed in your own head what's drawing you to to this particular Area. Well, um, yeah, I mean, our first novel, The Boy That Never Was, uh, was about uh, two parents who um, who lost a child. And the, myself and Karen are parents of young children. So I suppose our, um, you know, our writing went straight to our fears in that case. Mm -hmm. um, in our next novel, Only We Know, we wrote about uh, what happened to the parents and the children when the children do something bad. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I suppose, you know, very interested in that, you know, um, the relationships between people, um, between intimates, um, you know, married couples, their lovers, their children. Um, in, our, in our latest novel, which is coming out next month, Girl Unknown, um, the premise, again, is a married couple um, a history professor is sitting in his office in UCD. Uh, there's a knock on the door. A student walks in, one of his students, and says to him, I think you might be my father. And uh, so, you know, and, and she, she then goes on to disrupt the family life. Mm. Um, so I suppose in that sense, the kind of domestic relationships are interesting to myself and Karen. And mm. we're at a very similar stage in life. She's married and has a couple of kids, so I'm married have kids as well. Um, so that's kind of writing what's, you know, what's right around us. Mm. Um, and we're just exploring the psychology of um, what happens when things go wrong. Putting, putting the character under so much pressure. Yeah, all the time. All, I mean, as a writer, that's what you want to do. Yeah. If you want to write suspense, you're always trying to up the ante. Yeah. Um, you know, like our, our first novel opens with an earthquake, um, you know, and then we work towards a climax after that. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, so you're always trying to make your uh, characters uncomfortable. Um, you're trying to squeeze them and corner them and, uh, uh, you know, make obvious what the conflicts are within them and the external conflicts as mm. well. How do you both keep one step ahead of, of, of the reader then? Because, you know, you're putting your characters under pressure. What you don't want is the reader to have kind of gone, oh, no, I knew that was going to happen two chapters ago. So, you know, how, how is that managed? That yeah, You withhold information. So it's all about, I mean, for me, it's all about um, the misdirection, misdirecting the reader's attention, withholding crucial information and revealing it at the most disastrous and opportune time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for you? Yeah, well, yeah, there definitely is uh, an element of that. And also when you have your first draft done, I, you know, um, and you hope the soul of the novel is at least there, even if the prose isn't as beautiful as you want it to be. 
you, you can do some reconstruction to have that whole element of surprise. I think um, of the four novels, the one that I found the most challenging for that was actually Last Kiss. Um, and it's because um, I wanted to structure the story in such a way that there were actually clues there all along, but only in the third of the novel when mm -hmm. I, I actually decided to make it known to the reader that they went, oh yes, so that they, at that point the reader had no idea about a certain thing, but if they were really kind of odd like me mm. um, and went back to the book to read it again, they would realise that all the signs were there, it's just that they didn't see them. Mm. Mm. Um, so that was kind of particularly challenging because it was like you were giving the information but you were uh, presenting it in such a way that the reader was concentrating on something else within that particular um, chapter. Mm. So, and I think the reason you do that is not because you necessarily want to be a devious person or anything, but it's it's kind of part of the experience of crime fiction. Like whether you you know you're dealing in thriller or psychological thriller or police procedural or whatever it is, the reader wants to be challenged. Mm. You know, and they they they're. And most crime readers are actually um, big readers. They've read it all before, you know. And so if, if they're reading your work, you know, it's up to you to do something different and interesting with it. Mm -hmm. And so they like that challenge. To, and, they, and it's that whole mystery solving. Um, but, you know, also within the, I remember hearing a definition of thrillers once and it really helped me in my writing and it was that uh, the definition of a thriller is a sense of dread on every page. And that's partly created, as Paul says, mm. by withholding information. So the reader is never really sure of this story world or how comfortable or uncomfortable mm. they are within it. Mm -hmm. But they're sufficiently engaged in the characters that they, they want to move on. Mm, um, mm. And you get that wonderful term, page turning. Mm -hmm. So when there are two people involved in the writing, is it harder to kind of keep the mystery or easier because you're not expecting maybe Karen to think of a particular kind of mm -hmm. plot twist or vice versa or you know, what are the particular challenges with two people involved yeah, in it? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it's harder, or easier or harder. Um, it's it's different. I mean, um, you have our first three novels have had dual narratives, so husband and wife, two friends, and third novel, husband and wife, um, and they will have secrets from each other, um, secrets um, that um, that they haven't told anybody, and they will also lie to themselves mm. and to each other. Um, so in that sense, uh, the novels are also about kind of secrets and lies. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in terms, uh, and, and you've got two um, unreliable narrators. Um, so there are extra twists and turns, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. And that brings you into, uh, into territory that, uh, that is different if it were just one narrator. Mm -hmm. And what happens if, or have you ever had disagreements over the direction that the story is going in? Sure, yeah, we've disagreements all the time. So um, how, do you, how do you resolve those? Uh, well, with a lot of discussion, um, I mean, we actually met yesterday and a lot of our discussion, if you'd been, if you'd been overheard our conversation, was like, well, maybe this, no, maybe this. Uh, what if this happens? Maybe this. So we do a lot of that. Um, a lot of this and that. Uh, we do so a lot of discussion, but yeah, there's, there there are uh, there are disagreements all the time. But I think that's the in, that's part of the enjoyment of the process mm. is that you've got somebody else to second guess your ideas. You've got somebody there to um, be a sounding board to those ideas, and uh, and then to develop characters as well. Mm. In our first novel, one of the fa one of my favorite characters in the novel is a guy called Cosimo. Um, and really he was, you know, he was a minor character, but, um, which I had created, but Karen really drew that character out. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's a fascinating process. I may not have done that. I may mm -hmm. have just sketched him and left him the way he was. Mm -hmm. um, whereas he was, he was kind of um, more fully realized uh, through the collaborative process. Mm. So the, um, they're commercial novels. There must be pressure on both of you in terms of 
producing them because you know you have agents you have publishers uh they want the next book like you know what's it like living with that kind of pressure well um well uh, it is quite pressurized um but it's a good thing to complain about okay i will say that uh but when my first novel came out i i hadn't really an idea for my second novel uh, but whereas a lot of writers, they, they may be on their second novel by the time the first novel c comes out. Uh, and in simple terms, I was told, um, this is genre fiction. You know, if you really want to get your name out there, um, writing a novel a year is probably the best thing that you can do. Um, so I, I said about that, crazy and all as that might sound, and I achieved it, but I achieved it to the detriment of other elements of mm. my life, um, which is why this year I'm taking more time out and so I won't have a novel out till 2017 okay. because I simply said to the publishers, I will be writing about X and O if, 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 if I have to do this again. Mm. Um, but every writer's experience is different. I'm, on, reflect, on reflection, looking back, I'm happy with that because I had a deadline I went for it. It took away some of the insecurities that are associated with writing. Mm. I got the story down simply because I had to. And with each of them, I hope I've made them the best stories that they can be. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, you know, it, it, is, it is the way. Um, but hopefully it'll have eased off a little bit now that there are four novels out there. So in the year that a new novel has been produced, Roughly how much time is spent on the first draft, how much time? Well, again, everybody is kind edit. of different. I mean, I tend to write my first drafts in four months. That's it. Um, I tend to spend about a month, maybe two months between publicity, say, for the novels. So that's six months, uh, possibly another month, two months on copy editing. That's eight months. Invariably, there'll be a four week period um, where it'll be with the publishers and you might try and do something else like live your life and uh, so that goes on for about nine or ten months in total and then you have holidays and someone gets the flu and before you know it the year is gone and you're starting on uh, page one again. Wow, cycle. What's your, your schedule like? Well for our first novel we were uncontracted, unagented and we were writing for a lark but we still wrote it very quickly there was the sense of urgency because, you know, um, that was what was happening with the story itself and it was happening off the page because mm. we were we were dying to find out what would happen ourselves because we're readers as well as writers when we make the books. Um, but then, yes, uh, then with the agent and the contract and the book deal, um, book two, and we had the deadline and it was it was a year and it was it was really tough. Um, it was really tough for a number of reasons, um, some of which had to do with uh, editorial difference on either side of the Atlantic, oh, right. um, but also just the pressure of having to produce under deadline. Um, but I kind of relish that. Uh, there were times where you're really um, pulling your hair out. Um, there are other times where it's, it's just a fantastic place to be. Mm. Um, and with our th third novel, uh, we um, we drafted, redrafted, rewrote, and finished it. And I think the process took just over a year. And at the moment, we're being quite distracted by uh, we've had the first novel, The Boy That Never Was, optioned as uh, for film. Oh, super! Um, and we thought, Ray, this is fantastic news. And we went to went to meet the film company, and they turned around to us and said, Actually, we want you to write the screenplay. Oh, wow! Well. <laughs> and um, I eventually, or anyway, we we decided we would um, after some toing and froing, um, and that's kind of distracting because in 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 film company uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of meetings. Um, whereas with publishers, they might drop you an email or a quick mm. phone call. With publishers, they have meetings about everything. Mm. <laughs> mm. But uh, it's a lot of fun. But it is it is it is distracting because we still have that deadline for the next novel. Mm, mm -hmm. um, so I, I imagine this autumn is going to be a frenetic and furious time of writing to, to finish the fourth novel. Um, it might be a good opportunity to hear a little from it, if you were inclined, Paul. 
Sure, yeah. Um, our new novel is Girl Unknown, um, and it's coming out next month in June. Um, and I'll read you just this, the prologue, which, is, which is, isn't even a, a full page. Um, and it's a prologue, so it doesn't need any explanation. The water is cold, but there is a promise of heat in the air as the dawn begins to break. It will not be long before sunlight reaches the garden. Insects buzz and rustle in the undergrowth. The scent of lavender drifts from pots on the terrace. Drips roll from the edge of the diving board, making lazy, plopping sounds as they meet the rocking surface of the pool. A seagull landing on the wall casts a beady eye downward into the water, scouting for food, or maybe just curious. The drips from the diving board slow. The bird surveys the garden, the squat, silent house beyond, shadows on the terrace. It raises a wing and with its yellow beak jabs at its feathers, rearranging them. It straightens up, folds back its wing and looks down again. Something in the water rolls, or rather someone. The watchful seagull blinks, the water darkens, a face tilted, a figure submerged. The mouth is open, but there's no shining thread of bubbles, no silvery breath escaping. The only sound, the drip drip of blood hitting the slick surface of the pool before moving slowly through the blue-green water, mingling until it disappears. Ooh, very visual, very visual. Um, so that's going to be screenplay number three. Who presumably knows? Down the road. Yeah. Um, Louise, you have just been long-listed for a very important award, haven't you? The CWA Daggers Award, is that right? Which was a big surprise. Um, well done. Yeah. And, and it's also not just for one book, it's for, it's for, for a body, body of work. work. That, yeah, which, which makes it great. Well, it is it's great because I, I only actually found out about it this weekend. I was over in Bristol for Crime Fest, as was Paul. Um, and funnily enough, we passed by the hall where the announcements were being made to go to Tesco's to get large bottles of water. <laughs> <laughs> and then somebody told me la la later, by the way, you've been long listed. Wow. So uh, I think if I had have been there, they'd have probably picked me up yeah. off the floor, but it was great. But you're no stranger to awards because uh, the first book was it was was um, yeah all four the all four novels were shortlisted in the Irish Book Awards, and yeah. the second novel, The Doll's second novel House, won the award. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned the next one. Mm. Um, have you brought something related to that along, or what? I, I do. Yeah, I have a very short piece again. It's just a page and a half. So we're, no, we're, get, we're getting exclusive. Exclusive. Yeah. exclusive. Well, you. this uh, this little one is the um, is the latest one, which is out in paperback for the last couple of months, which is the game changer, and that's kind of the end of the. At the moment, the, the Kate Pearson, Kate Pearson. Ser series. So, um, as mentioned earlier, the next book is based in the US, uh, partly Boston and partly the South Shore. So, I did some research there a couple of weeks ago. So that was that was good fun. But anyway, I'll just read you the, the I'll do this. I'll just read you the opening of um, this. And the, the novel at the moment has the working title "After I Was Killed," and this is the voice of Isabel, who is dead at the opening of the novel. Um, I know for sure that I am dead. What I don't know is who killed me. They say that after you die you see a bright light. It is sometimes at the end of a long tunnel or behind, behind an open door willing you to the other side. I didn't see either of those things. What I saw was my life pass before me, all 21 years of it starting March 3rd, 1980. The date was circled in red on the calendar in the hall. The place, our old family home in Cohasset, Massachusetts. I was seven months old. My mother Elizabeth was in the kitchen. There was a smell of hot apple pie. She hadn't baked for months, not since I was born, and she had been hit with the baby blues. Large droplets of rain clung to the window panes, and there was a cold sharpness about the day. My sister, Heather, was drawn from her bedroom because of the smell of warm pastry. She was the first person I saw after I died. She was 14 years old and she was walking downstairs. Our mother would be murdered soon. There was only three of us in the house and we weren't even supposed to be there. We had left that morning with our grandmother, but halfway into town, my mother asked her to turn the car around, saying she wanted to stay at home instead. 
Our grandmother protested, but she finally gave in. If she hadn't, maybe none of it would have happened. My sister was midway down the stairs when she stopped. She had a frown on her face, followed by a look of confusion and fear. I heard the sound of rushed footsteps coming from out back. I took all of this in, knowing every piece of information was important now. Hedda looked towards my bedroom, the door to my room ajar. It was dark inside with the heavy curtains pulled over to keep out the light. I was asleep in my cot, lying on my side, my face turned towards the wall, covering the port wine birthmark on my right cheek. The birthmark stretched from below my eyelid to my lips in the shape of a half moon. The quilt covering me had different colour elephants on it. There was a silence in the house then, except for the sound of my infant self softly breathing and the clock on the landing ticking. Heather stood in her stocking feet. She was wearing navy jeans and a blue hoodie with the word Kingston engraved in white on the back. Placing her foot on the next step, she heard the sound of the back door handle turn. She peered over the banisters and saw the two men, then jerked backwards so they wouldn't see her. Both of them wore dark clothes, their faces covered except for their eyes and mouth. Five minutes earlier she had been plaiting her hair, thinking about a boy. His name was Daniel. She had wondered about their first kiss, knowing it would happen soon, away from family and prying eyes. She wanted to look nice for him, convinced he liked her too. Thinking about that boy, she felt carefree, but seeing the intruders, she thought of a black cloak swallowing everything in its path. The word entombed came into her mind, and I wondered if even then she knew all of this was fated. Wow. And again, very visual. Um, like, with that and with the, um, the four previous ones, have you thought in terms of like what the movie version might be or, or you know, no, except that I, I tend to do, I tend to think in the visual. Um, I think it's partly because I grew up reading books and watching television with fizzy things going across the screen. Um, but I was definitely very much into television and, and cinema growing up. Mm -hmm. So it kind of feels like a natural extension of it. Like, I, I, I don't know whether you feel the same way, Paul, but I, I often want to see the picture in my mind. It's partly myself entering that fictional mm, world. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I suppose you know, we're coming to the end of, of this particular interview. So what I just wondered for both of you is, is you know, what, what's the big ambition? What, what would happen to make you feel, yes, this was absolutely what I've been working towards? And, and is it the movie, Paul? Is it what, what well, I'm just enjoying the whole process at the moment. Um, I mean, t it's a real pleasure to work with such a brilliant writer, Karen Gillies. Um, um, we joked when we first started writing the book about getting an agent and there, bidding, there being a bidding war in the US, and we joked about movies, and um, and it's all <laughs> it's all happening. So, like, you know, so I'm just enjoying it. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's it's a real pleasure to be working with with another writer um, who's who's so professional um, and and so brilliant. Um, so the the next stage is the next book, and um, you know whatever happens happens. Okay, and Louise. Yeah, I, I suppose that my ambitions have changed from the start of the journey till now. I think it, it initially. Um, I kind of came from a position of desperation and I was just kind of clawing my way towards being able to write novels and for people to read them. Uh, I certainly think taking the time out over the last few months has helped me to reassess what has gone before and to get, you know, I, like I enjoyed it all the time, but to, to really evaluate the sense of joy of creating stories and people reading your stories. Um, and in many ways, I think I've come to the juncture, even though I haven't got the movie deal yet, she says, um, or any of kind of that kind of bigger stuff that other people m may aspire to. And I'm aspiring to it too. Mm. I, I think I'm coming from a good place that I feel I've done well. Mm. And um, if I can write another story that I'm happy with, 
but that's that's it. The rest is just decoration. Mm. Well, that that's a pretty zen position to be in at at this stage. So thank you very much, Louise Phillips and and Paul Perry. It's been great to have you in the attic. Um, we'll have details of both their latest books on the website. Um, and until next month, where we're going to be taking the attic on a little trip up to Belfast. Um, thank you for watching the attic sessions. Yes, I know that I'm just a dreamer. I dream because it's the closest I'll ever get to you.